Hi, this is Rob Beardsley with Lone Star Capital, and today we're talking about quarterly reporting. So the reason why I wanted to make this video is because we're actually in the process of revamping our quarterly reporting, and I figured it'd be a good time to share some of the ideas that we believe in in terms of what makes a good quarterly report. So first off, I want to take a step back and you know answer the question of what, what is quarterly reporting and, and why do it? So number one, quarterly reporting in this context is actually presenting the uh, financials and the cash position and the progress of the business plan to your investors, limited partners, and even co-GP partners. Um, and so the standard uh, frequency of reporting is quarterly, but it is also very common for sponsors to, to keep their investors updated on a monthly basis. I think uh, both work really great. I, I think monthly is actually awesome to give that constant contact similar to a monthly distribution versus a quarterly distribution. Obviously, an investor loves getting monthly checks. But the problem with monthly is you tend to make less substantive, less substantive reporting on a monthly basis and more of just kind of a general update, maybe some photos and maybe talk about a, an event that was thrown at the, at, the, uh, at the property rather than a real deal quarterly report, which has true financial metrics and and, and re, you know, real numbers that actually tell an investor what's going on with the deal. So to focus on what those are, let's start number one with budget versus actual. So this is a really important uh, element of a quarterly report. And what it does is it shows the actual financials of that quarter and you know, potentially of, of that year to date and the investment to date and compare it to your budget or even more accurately to your uh, historical underwriting. So the, act, the underwriting that you actually use to make the financial projections to acquire the property. So as an example, if my acquisition underwriting uh, said that the project is projected to return 15% IRR and an 8% cash on cash, and those are the numbers that I actually pitched investors with, that would be my acquisition underwriting. And I would benchmark every quarter's numbers versus the numbers that went into that acquisition underwriting to produce those projected returns. Pretty straightforward, but very few people do it because that level of transparency is just scary. You know, and not a lot of people want to actually benchmark themselves to that because as we all know, underwriting tends to be aggressive to, you know, get a deal to, to pencil and, and get it to close. But nevertheless, we believe strongly in under promising and over delivering. And I think investors do really appreciate that transparency. Another thing that this type of you know, acquisition underwriting versus actual does is since we internally know that we're going to be held accountable to that in each and every quarterly report, we underwrite with that in mind. As we're looking at new deals, we know that we can't push the numbers beyond where we're comfortable because it's going to be there every single quarter reminding us of you know, whatever mistakes we, we may have made or, or hopefully don't make. So I think that's a really helpful thing to do uh, in your quarterly reporting, which not only helps your investors and builds that that trust and transparency, but also kind of keeps you focused and honest as you underwrite. So another uh, simple but very important piece of information to have in a quarterly report is your cash position and kind of understanding um, your reserve balance and capex balance and all those things. So, for example, if you started out the deal with a hundred thousand dollars in an operating reserve, you know an investor is going to want to know the balance of that reserve on a on a quarterly basis. So, you know, did we have a tough month and actually have to dip into that operating reserve and now it's dropped to ninety or seventy thousand dollars? And then, do we have a plan to replenish it back up to a hundred? Uh, you know, another example would be, let's say we're making a distribution to the investors. Well, the investors should be happy. But what if that distribution came at the expense of uh, depleting the operating reserve? Right. So just being aware of the cash position uh, as it relates to the, you know, the operating account or the uh, operating reserve account and as well as the CapEx, which we'll discuss in a second. Those are important and, and really simple numbers to track over time. Now, the, the CapEx budget is really focused for the initial value add or the, the business plan of the deal. And this is also very helpful because if you, let's say, have a million dollar CapEx budget and 
you know, you go over budget, it's helpful for investors to track that and see that over time. So they can see that, you know, you're, let's say six out of 12 months into your projected budget where you anticipate spending a million dollars and you've already spent, you know, let's say 600, 700,000, you know, you might be anticipating going over budget based on that timeline. Or maybe that indicates that you're implementing your, but your, your CapEx budget and your value add business plan faster than you expected and you're, you're anticipating stabilization um, ahead of schedule. So that's another helpful thing to, to track. And you can see where we came under budget, over budget on the CapEx, um, which is obviously great for investors to, to have that knowledge of. Um, just some, some concluding thoughts. I think uh, with quarterly reporting, as I mentioned, you, know, you wanna have some commentary for these numbers. You know, Without speaking to the numbers, the numbers could be misunderstood or, you know, uh, not you want to paint them in a, in a positive light. So it's good to have some commentary and back the numbers up with explanations uh, so you don't just leave people more confused with what the heck's going on. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot more that can go into quarterly reporting about, um, you know, a refinance or a supplemental loan or, you know, a potential sale that's on the way. But those are the, the core building blocks of a good strong quarterly report and uh, thanks so much for watching.